In this section, we will learn about different types of air masses and fronts and how they impact air quality. An air mass is a three-dimensional large body of air with similar temperature and moisture properties throughout. A front is a boundary or transition zone between different air masses. Forecasters look for fronts because a change in air mass directly leads to a change in air quality conditions. Air masses are classified based on whether they developed over land or water and in a warm or cold environment. The standard types include continental polar, maritime polar, maritime tropical, and continental tropical. A continental polar air mass is typically cold, dry, and stable. An extremely cold air mass may be designated continental arctic. Maritime polar air mass is typically cool, moist, and unstable. A maritime tropical air mass is warm, moist, and usually unstable, and a continental tropical air mass is typically hot and dry with stable air aloft, but sometimes can have unstable air at the surface. In this surface temperature map, there is a continental polar air mass over central Canada where temperatures are very cold. There is a maritime tropical air mass over the Gulf of Mexico where temperatures are warm. Now, air mass temperature and moisture can be changed by different land types over which the air mass moves. This schematic shows how an air mass that starts cool and moist on the west coast dries out as it moves east and passes over several mountain ranges. So in this case, the air mass started out as maritime polar, but has turned into a continental polar air mass by the time it has moved past all the mountain ranges. A front is the boundary or transition zone between different air masses. On screen, you can see an example of a low pressure system and its fronts and the associated air masses. Behind the cold front, we see cold, dry, usually clean air. Between the warm front and the cold front, it is often warm, moist, and polluted. And ahead of the warm front, it is cool and can sometimes be polluted here as well. So how are the fronts depicted on weather maps? Let's start with cold fronts. You can see a cold front is drawn in blue. It has triangles pointing in the direction that the front is moving, and that is the direction towards the warmer temperatures. So on the back side of the front, we have colder air, and ahead of the front, we have warmer air. Moving on to the warm front, a warm front is always drawn in red, and it has half circles pointing in the direction that the front is moving, which is toward the colder temperatures. So we have the warmer air on the back side of the front and the colder air ahead of the front. Next we have a stationary front, and this is drawn in alternating blue triangles and red half circles, where the blue triangles are pointing towards the warmer air, and the red half circles are pointing towards the colder air. You can think of this as could turn into a warm front or a cold front, depending on which way it starts to move. Finally, we have an occluded front, which is drawn in purple, and the purple symbols on it are alternating triangles and half circles, all pointing in the direction in which the front is moving. Now, an occluded front is not as dramatic of a passage as a warm front or a cold front, because it's actually aloft, but it typically has colder air on the back side and cool air on the front side. So what is a cold front? It is a boundary that moves in such a way that the colder, more dense air advances and displaces the warmer, less dense air. The leading edge of the front is generally fairly steep, which can cause the warm air ahead of it to rise rapidly as it is displaced. This warm air updraft leads to shower and thunderstorm development along the boundary of the front, as you can see in this graphic. This table gives you a summary of the typical conditions expected before a cold front passes, while it is passing, and after it passes. Several of the boxes are highlighted in red, and these are the features that are easy for you to identify on surface weather maps and are important for air quality forecasting. For example, the winds are typically out of the southeast to southwest before a cold front passes. They get very gusty while the front is passing, and then after the front, they have turned westerly to northwest. A warm front is a boundary that moves in such a way that the colder, more dense air retreats and is replaced by the warmer, less dense air. The warm air rises up over the colder air at the surface, and the slope of this rise is usually not as steep as what we see along a cold frontal boundary. As this warm air rises up over the cold air, 
Clouds and precipitation will develop, just as with the cold front. However, because the slope is less steep, the clouds and precipitation are usually much further in advance of the boundary than what we see with a cold front. And here's a table that summarizes the weather characteristics expected with a warm front before it passes, while it's passing, and after it's passing. Again, we've highlighted some of the key, key weather parameters to look at in red. If we look at the wind example again, we can see that before a warm front passes, the winds are typically out of the south-southeast. While it's passing, they're variable, but not terribly gusty, like with a cold front. And after the warm front passes, winds are usually south to southwest. Now let's look at stationary fronts. A stationary front shows little movement. However, it is not truly stationary. It acts as a warm or a cold front, depending on the direction of movement relative to your given location. So if you are directly under the position of a stationary front, you can have rapid weather changes occurring as it moves back and forth over your area. These can be associated with high PM 2.5 in some parts of the country. And finally, an occluded front, which we briefly mentioned earlier when we were showing the different types of front symbols that you would find on a weather map. This is what occurs when a cold front overtakes a warm front. Cold fronts typically move much faster than a warm front, so as you can see on the graphic, it's almost as if the cold front is eating away at the warm front as they catch up to each other. The physics behind an occluded front are pretty complex in nature, so we're not going to get into the details of that. But for air quality purposes, it behaves similar to a cold front in that it will clean out any poor air quality that you have had in your area. So how do you identify a front? Well, if you're looking at the surface, if warm air replaces colder air, the front is a warm front. If cold air replaces warmer air, the front is a cold front. If the front does not move or does not have significant movement, it is a stationary front. So what do air quality forecasters need to be on the lookout for? With approaching weak fronts, the associated stagnation can lead to high PM 2.5. In addition, weak fronts can slide over valleys and basins with strong temperature inversions without ventilating the area. So depending on the topography where you live, a weak front may do nothing to improve your air quality. With approaching strong fronts, Gusty southwesterly winds in advance of the strong cold front can lead to lower PM 2.5 concentrations even before the front passes. The timing of a frontal passage is critical for consideration. Prior to frontal passage, concentrations are often higher than after frontal passage. So if your front is not going to move through until late in the day, you may still have very high AQI levels for the day. Finally, we need to consider the strength of the northwesterly winds behind a cold front. Moderate to strong winds can lead to very good air quality conditions. However, light or stagnant conditions and a cold air mass that may set in right behind the cold front can lead to a rapid increase in PM 2.5, especially if this happens overnight. Here's an example of a frontal passage and its impact on air quality. You can see from this animation that ahead of the cold front, AQI levels are in the moderate to unhealthy for sensitive groups range, and as the front moves through the Great Lakes region, the air quality index drops to good behind the front with just a few sites lingering at the low moderate AQI levels. So this shows the transition from a warm, moist, polluted air mass into a clean, cold, dry air mass and cleaner air quality. So to summarize, fronts can increase dispersion and mixing. However, a cold, dry air mass tends to develop stable conditions at night, allowing PM 2.5 to accumulate near the ground, so a cold frontal passage in and of itself does not necessarily mean good air quality for the next day or so, depending on what the winds and everything else is forecasted to do. And a moist air mass is conducive to secondary PM 2.5 formation, particularly for nitrates and sulfates.